Okay, I'm going to call this session to order, and uh, thank you all for being here this morning. Uh, this will be our last uh, session uh, for this terrific um, Arctic Circle Wilson Center gathering. It's been a great group, and I know a lot of great conversations are still going on, so we welcome those to continue to join us. Uh, and this last session is, going, is about operating safely and securely in Arctic waters. And we have really a, just a fabulous, terrific panel. Again, I'm Sherry Goodman. I had the pleasure of meeting many of you yesterday. I'm now a senior fellow here at the Wilson Center. I served eight years as Deputy Undersecretary of Defense for uh, Environmental Security. I'm founder of the CNA Military Advisory Board, which uh, for a decade now has been issuing a clarion call on the national security challenges associated with climate change and energy. And we pointed a decade ago to the changes occurring very rapidly in the Arctic and the need to have operational capability in there. And I'm pleased to see so many of my friends here from um, the Coast Guard, uh, Navy, other parts of, um, of the U.S., and many of our diplomatic friends uh, as well, because this is an area where we all have to work together. Um, and as I told the story yesterday about uh, working with the Russians back now 20 years ago in Arctic military environmental cooperation. Uh, and so this is a, um, a, a great, we have a great panel here. And the theme of this panel and the question that I've asked each of our panelists to address, um, I'll throw it out there and then I'll, I'll introduce them. They'll each have about five minutes for opening remarks is what keeps you up at night in terms of operating in Arctic waters? And what should we be doing about it now to address those risks? Okay, now all of you here, if you're here, you care about this subject, uh, you're already an expert in it, or you, you want to be, you want to be involved. So I know there's gonna be a lot of good thoughts and discussions, but we have a great panel. Um, so Lawson Brigham, I'm sure many of you uh, Heard Lawson yesterday. He's at the University of Alaska Fairbanks, uh, uh, retired Air um, Coast Guard officer, written extensively on this. I've worked with Lawson over many years, had the chance uh, over the last year, he and I served on the Council on Foreign Relations uh, Arctic Task Force, um, uh, and which he, we, he provided a lot of important comments, particularly about the need for Arctic uh, infrastructure and uh, capabilities. Uh, Taro Varesti is known to all of you now because he served with distinction throughout this, this conference uh, and uh, provides very, very important uh, capabilities uh, through, his, through the Arctic Economic Council uh, as well as his work with Arctia, Arctia and is, is known to, to uh, many of you and uh, has great and deep knowledge uh, of, of all things Arctic. And Mead, uh, also my dear friend who has been uh, working in this field now as well, lieutenant, former lieutenant governor of Alaska, uh, PT Capital, very deeply associated with the Wilson Center Polar Initiative, very thoughtful, as you probably heard his remarks yesterday about the uh, St. Lawrence Seaway concept and others for how to operate in the Arctic. So we're looking forward to hearing more about that. Um, Desmond Raymond is our uh, Canadian expert here today. Desmond, we're very pleased to have you. Um, Regional Director of Marine Safety and Security at Transport Canada um, and has a great deal of experience operating in the Arctic. So I'm very much looking forward um, to your perspective. And finally, my good friend, Jeremy Mathis, uh, who's taught me a lot about Arctic science uh, leads NOAA's Arctic Science Research Program, but also is, is deeply engaged in how to marshal and galvanize the, the science and research community to put it to use for safety and operational security in Arctic waters. Okay, um, Lawson, you said you had a couple of slides you want to show us, and uh, why, don't you, why don't you kick it off? Well, good morning, everyone. Uh, what, what wasn't mentioned yesterday in the spirit of uh, U.S. and Russia relations in the Arctic is that uh, R Russia and the United States work uh, closely on Arctic issues in a wide variety of international organizations. Do, do I have to press this? Can everyone hear me? Is it working? Go closer. 
the two countries work uh, seamlessly on Arctic issues at IMO, of course, the International Maritime Organization, IHO, the International Hydrographic Organization, and the IHO has a uh, uh, Arctic Regional Hydrographic Commission, fairly, fairly new. And then finally, uh, uh, WMO, of course, IASC, and all these acronyms from the Arctic and polar world. But, but the two countries work uh, quite closely on specific Arctic issues, although their national interests may, may diverge, particularly on uh, in IMO, they, they merge quite, quite nicely. And one of the issues that dealt with the last uh, quarter of a century is this IMO Polar Code. And uh, the Polar Code, of course, is a new uh, governance regime in polar waters, uh, second only, I would say, to the uh, unclose, uh, pervasive, uh, circumpolar, uh, bipolar, however you want to call it, the Polar Code is a very historic <laughs> new um, regime and it's governance and it's mandatory. So it, it's p perhaps, even though it's technical and it's maritime, fairly narrowly focused on, on, on certain ships, it is uh, an important and historic development in Arctic history, I, I would argue. Um, Part, part of the polar code, the impetus, impetus to have mandatory guidelines, move from guidelines, voluntary to mandatory, was the Arctic Marine Shipping Assessment, where the Arctic states called for, and we had 17 recommendations, but the most important one was having mandatory uh, rules and regulations for polar operating ships. And the polar code, just the boundary in the south, it's 60 south, in the Southern Ocean, but in the North, it's complicated, is, is, uh, is the issue. Uh, and in, it's 60 uh, North for the boundary in the Bering Sea. And partly the reason for establishing that boundary there, and not the Arctic Circle, was to, in part, uh, protect the uh, world-class fishery that is in the Bering Sea. And the Bering Sea partially covered, seasonally ice-covered uh, uh, ocean, kind of like the uh, Baltic. And, and so the Polar Code begins at 60 north. And in the Atlantic, of course, the line zigzags its way, um, correlating with the Gulf Stream and the northward North Atlantic Drift, and intersects uh, above Iceland and on the uh, Russian coast. And so it is a complicated boundary. The boundary, in fact, uh, you know, could ad ad be adjusted in the future with, with the retreat of sea ice. And the Polar Code, here's a one-page snapshot of it. Polar Code, excuse me, again, is technical. Uh, it, uh, the Code is uh, a set of amendments to SOLAS, the Safety of Life at Sea Convention, uh, the MARPOL, the Marine Pollution Convention, and STCW, another crazy acronym from the maritime world, is Standards of Training, Certification, and Watchkeeping, the human dimension of who, who's driving the boat, essentially. And so these amendments cover marine safety, the structural standards of the ship, the experience and the training of, of the mariners. And on the MARPOL side, at, at the bottom there, uh, it covers a wide range of amendments uh, in, in MARPOL for uh, oil, oily waste, noxious liquids, sewage, and garbage. <coughs> so, so the Polar Code is a set of uh, new amendments and, and new rules and regulations Supposedly uniform, they're non-discriminatory for uh, ships, uh, commercial ships, so uh, LNG carriers, uh, tankers, bulk carriers, all over 500 tons, and then across the cruise ship industry uh, now have mandatory rules. Uh, you, you note that it took 24 years, 1993 was the first meeting of an outside working group to IMO, and then it advanced through guidelines and then finally mandatory rules. Some challenges for the, for the Polar Code, or there are many. The implementation timeline is over the next uh, two years. The Polar Code came into force on 1 January this year. So let's say ships going to Red Dog Mine. They cross the boundary, they go and anchor off Kivalina and, and the Red Dog Mine, they pick up a high-grade iron ore. And so they're under the Polar Code, uh, even the older ships are under the Polar Code today because you have to have this Polar Certificate. One of the interesting devices is that you must have, in order to operate in polar waters, all, all these ships must have a polar certificate and also another device, kind of a measure to uh, a polar water 
uh, operational manual. It's kind of odd English. It should be Polar Waters operational manual, but nonetheless, that's what it is. And, and it's something designed specifically to ship. So you must have these, these documents. And if you, let's say, go to Nome and you anchor off with a cruise ship and you're headed into Polar Waters, if you don't have the Coast Guard, U.S. Coast Guard will go aboard. The first thing you ask the captain, let me see your Polar certificate. So it's an interesting device. You see all of the range of, of, uh, of, of other of the challenges. Most important will be, I think, uh, the, uh, the implementation of costs and the enforcement and how this Polar Code is enforced, either individually by the coastal states and, and the port under sport, port uh, state control in the Arctic, or perhaps, hopefully, uh, kind of integrated enforcement. And maybe the Coast Guard Forum has one idea the, the Arctic Coast Guard Forum, which uh, the Commandant spoke uh, yesterday about, might be involved in this uh, kind of integrated enforcement. The Polar Code, uh, as noted in the slide, is only one component, not small and pervasive component of infrastructure. It's not physical infrastructure, it, it's governance, of course, and, and it's regulatory. But nonetheless, to, okay, one more slide, and, and uh, future issues. When the Polar Code is released, uh, lots of folks, particularly from the NGO community, unhappy about the Polar Code because it didn't cover heavy fuel oil in the North, didn't cover emissions, didn't cover a whole host of uh, other, other issues, that, that black carbon in particular. All of these will come about in the next decade or more. Uh, the Polar Code is, is a moving target, it's evolutionary. Um, it will be interesting to see uh, how the Polar Code and the measures taken for ships are integrated with other measures like marine protected areas, PSSA, and other general protected areas. The most important thing in the future for the Polar Code, it's uniform, uniformity across the uh, whole of the circumpolar Arctic. And what that really means is how Canada and Russia integrate the Polar Code into their already existing uh, Canadian pollution prevention regulations and laws are being developed, I think, already. Maybe our Des will talk about that. And, and, and also on the Russian side, how the Polar Code is integrated with the Russian uh, Northern Sea Route regulations. Because the rest of the place, <laughs> we don't have any special regulations. A couple small ones off of Greenland. So for the United States, we implement the Polar Code and that is our new regulatory environment in the Bering Strait region. So thank you. Lawson, thank you very much. And uh, let me ask you are, you, are you sleeping more soundly at night now that the uh, IMO Polar Code has been uh, uh, well, it, 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 established? Yeah, yes and no, I guess. Uh, fortunately, when I was captain of a bunch of a uh, number of Coast Guard cutters, I, I, I sleep at night now because I didn't have any accidents in the middle of the night somewhere around the world. But uh, for the Polar Code, when, when we released the Arctic Marine Shipping Assessment, the biggest challenge, and it remains today, large cruise ship in the Arctic, uh, 1,000 to 3,000 passengers. What does it do in there? Of course, making money, <laughs> commercial venture. But what the heck is it doing there? And that is the challenge for the Arctic states, uh, particularly I'll single out Greenland. Lots of large cruise ships operating in waters without charge. So that, even the Polar Code, with the Polar Code, uh, uh, ships can operate in polar waters that are an ice covered, like a cruise ship. And the question is, can they meet the other standards and still operate safely? And as I mentioned yesterday, 10% of the Arctic Ocean is charted in international standards, only 4.7 for the United States. But nonetheless, uh, if you're operating the coast of Greenland where there are minimal charts, I think that would keep me up if I was a Danish uh, naval officer involved in operations in Greenland. So the large cruise ships is the biggest challenge remaining today, both ends of the world. Okay. Thank you. Thank you very much, Lawson. And I think that tees up nicely some discussion later with our Russian and Canadian colleagues about um, the application of the IMO uh, Polar Code and as well for our Coast Guard colleagues on the uh, value of the Coast Guard, um, Arctic Coast Guard Forum as an enforcement mechanism. Uh, Taro, over to you. What keeps me awake at night? That was your question. Yes. It's my cell phone and if uh, it says that it's the Arctia duty officer. That keeps me awake at night. <laughs> and it really kept me awake when Fenica was in Dutch Harbor 2015. And uh, it left the harbor 
and uh, it hit the bottom. And uh, the C chart provided by NOAA didn't provide uh, that accurate information. <laughs> Jeremy so, wants to fix that. He's yep. got the plan. Yep. Just give him enough money. That's right. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> Where's the guy with the trillion dollars? Yeah. <laughs> he left already. That keeps me awake at night. Okay. Okay. <laughs> um, here we have uh, a sneak peek to uh, our forthcoming uh, brochure uh, of the world's icebreaker fleet. So um, it's a 130 or 140 vessels. And um, I tried to count the asset in terms of creating a global icebreaker balance sheet. And it's somewhat difficult, but maybe around $10 billion is not very erroneous, maybe 12, maybe eight, I don't know. Uh, and it's actually quite low figure because the average age of the icebreakers uh, is uh, more than 30 years. So if you think of the f budget of uh, the U.S. Uh, forthcoming acquisitions, one icebreaker is uh, $1.2 billion, and the current asset is uh, maybe $10 billion. So uh, there is a significant amount of new investments which are coming into play. Okay. Uh, unfortunately, you, the U.S. icebreakers are not visible here because it's uh, only... There aren't only many the, of them. Well, uh, but, but <laughs> if, you, if you, you turn here, <laughs> you see them. <laughs> so, um, All one and half of them. Yeah, so um, when we work together in the Arctic, one of the questions for this panel was international collaboration. Yeah. Um, we have this asset of $10 billion, and uh, we need to renew more or less the whole fleet within the next 10 or 15 years. All the countries here in, in, this, in this game are in sort of uh, having a renewal program. Why are we doing this alone? Why don't we collaborate more? Uh, this is the message which uh, has been sent out from the industry for, for a certain period of time already. Um, you have a look into the utilization rate. My icebreakers, when they walk on the Baltic Sea, they have a utilization rate of 30%. So they are used for three or four months. And when they work, when they are out at the sea, most of the time they are waiting for somebody to be helped. And again, the utilization rate is 30%. And this is the case with, with most of the fleet, actually. So uh, shouldn't we have a holistic view into this, this question and, uh, and, and do this together? in terms of uh, Arctic Circle or, 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 or Arctic Council and international collaboration and, uh, and not having the Uber for icebreakers because the Uber CEO was sacked the day before yesterday. <laughs> but let's better speak about icebreaker B&B. That might be icebreaker a better... Icebreaker B&B. Yes, you heard yes. it here for the for, first time. For lift for icebreakers. <laughs> yeah. that, that's right. That's right. Yeah. In that way, we could save a lot of money. In, in working together, first with the current fleet, but yet again for the future when we, we, we are obliged to do the, do, to do the new investments. Um, if you think of uh, the fact that uh, um, is uh, the collaboration a matter of price or is it a matter of pride? So um, we've noticed that uh, there are, you know, of course there are sovereignty issues, that's clear. But uh, there are also these national pride issues. And I think that in terms of Arctic collaborations, maybe we should have Arctic pride and not national pride. Um, we have uh, great examples of uh, great new technologies, uh, new LNG-powered icebreaker, which is very environmentally friendly. There will be new icebreakers coming into the uh, play which will uh, make sure that in the future uh, the uh, polar routes are uh, navigated in a safe manner. But that's not enough. We need skillful crews. And actually, skillful crews uh, in the Arctic, we don't have that much of those. So definitely we need to, yes, invest into uh, the icebreakers, but also invest into the human capacity in terms of operations, because uh, We've heard today and the day before, uh, uh, and, and yesterday, that uh, there will be lots of new operations in the Arctic, and skillful crews are really required for that. Uh, we should look into the whole value chain in terms of having a look into the icebreaker design, icebreaker building, icebreaker operation, maintenance, and do it together. 
So uh, that would save us money. That would be much more coherent. That would uh, be a great example of uh, breaching the gaps. And uh, we'll learn that uh, any of the Arctic countries has no obstacles. So, so it's not just let's let's not just talk, as we heard from Mr. Young yesterday. Let's do it. Thank you. Thank you, uh, Tara. That was that was an uh, excellent excellent overview and uh, compelling set of remarks on um, the need to uh, recapitalize the icebreaker fleet globally and work together on it. Um, and let me ask you about the, you raised a point about human capital, which is very interesting. And it's been a theme that has run throughout um, our conversations here the last day and a half uh, from the University of the Arctic concept and the ways in which uh, the nations of the Arctic are already working together in education um, and research. And now this, what, what are your uh, thoughts about how we can utilize collaboratively um, common education and research or other institutions to build that human capital? And also we talked in the last panel about the transition um, you know, in, in the indigenous community and the need to uh, enable both retention of culture but at the same time uh, advancement into uh, some of the new, new ways in which people will work in the Arctic? Um, if you look into the uh, icebreaker question, so definitely it's uh, increased use of new simulators because uh, you can't uh, learn how to work on an icebreaker uh, at, at school. So you have to do it in practice. Yet again, the opportunities for do it, doing that in practice are limited. So there are already some new great simulators around the world uh, which provide you an opportunity to train how to, how to run an icebreaker. So, so that's uh, definitely one. So that, that, that's actually sort of e-learning as well. In terms of uh, combining the uh, indigenous uh, communities into this, so, and, and, and when we work over there, so that's a matter of communication. Uh, and uh, you should really have a look into uh, their knowledge and, and their views and their know-how once you make decisions uh, on how you operate, when you operate, because uh, uh, they are the ones who have been there for centuries. Thank you. Mead. Well, thanks. Uh, Sherry, uh, while, while I start, uh, I think we've got two... Uh, two presentations, if you could put up the Russian Northern Sea Route presentation while I'm talking about this. Um, I've had two jobs where I have lost lots of sleep at night. Um, <coughs> I was a deputy commissioner of environmental conservation in Alaska after the Exxon Valdez and uh, uh, carried a pager. This was before cell phones and that pager would go off anytime there was an oil spill or a major environmental issue. And then as Lieutenant Governor, I, I remember staying up all night uh, as we were watching the Fukushima disaster in Japan mm -hmm. and uh, wondering whether or not people in Dutch Harbor were going to live, uh, watching floods in Galena. Uh, I can remember a number of forest fires that kept me up all night. And I guess what I've told mayors uh, in the Bering Sea western area of Alaska, uh, essentially what we learned during Exxon Valdez is you don't want to be meeting the Coast Guard and the Spiller at one in the morning. You want to know them already. If there's a risk of an environmental accident, and with new shipping there will be risks, there needs to be oil spill prevention and response programs that, are, that start at the community level. Right. Right? And the community level, you've heard from Western Alaska communities, the reason why Western Alaska communities want ports it's not just for economic development, but be part of prevention and response. Mm -hmm. And you can't have a good response, you can't have good prevention unless you have the communities there. It's the people who live there who will tell you, uh, if you've only got enough boom to boom off one stream, here's where the fish are. If you only have uh, enough capability to, uh, to hold off, uh, you know, to, to hold off a, a ship off the rocks, please avoid these rocks because that's where the rookery is. And these people, uh, I'm just going to say this, for the people on both sides of the Bering Strait, we can talk about all the geopolitics you want of shipping in the Arctic. This, you are going through a breadbasket. Seventy percent in Alaska of the food that people eat who live in western Alaska is something they've speared, something they've shot, something they've netted, something they've hooked, something they've gathered. Okay? 
and it is very, very important that we remember food security as we look at this. And so that's what keeps me up at night, as I want to make sure that when we do have to get up at night, we already know each other. The second thing that, uh, that does keep me up at night, and it uh, keeps me hopping around the world at, uh, in my current job, is how do you pay for this stuff? And what I wanted to show you very quickly was, uh, because it, it, it didn't come up in the conference, I, I uh, had hoped uh, that uh, some of the Russian participants would talk about this. We had great representation from Russia yesterday on the program. Uh, but uh, at the Arctic Economic Council in February, there was a presentation made uh, by the Far East and Bakal Region Development Fund on a study that uh, used outside consultants to, uh, to, to look at the economics of the Northern Sea Route and the Russians asking themselves the question, how do we pay for the facilities that, sh that you need? And uh, it was Nikolai Monko uh, who, who made the presentation. Thanks, Taro. Uh, I don't have the clicker, uh, but uh, I just want to show you a couple of, couple of fast slides here. Uh, one, one is that they took a look at the Northern Sea Route in its competitive position versus Suez, Panama, Malacca Strait, and current use of the Northern Sea Route today. And uh, one estimate, uh, and you know, Lawson and I have a dinner bet in 2020, if there's not regular container service, I buy him a steak dinner. Uh, if there is, uh, he buys me a steak Give dinner. Give me a million dollars. Uh, <laughs> but, uh, uh, but, but at any rate, the, the, the point is this, is that the, the Russians looked at the uh, addressable market uh, perhaps uh, 455,000 TEUs that could uh, work, on the, uh, work on the Northern Sea Route, or even as much as 4.1 million TEUs. If you take a look at the current trade between these city pairs, Yokohama, uh, Busan, Shanghai, Tianjin, et cetera, and, uh, and ports in Europe. And th it's this set of city pairs that they saw as the competitive advantage for container service if you can have an escort service for icebreakers that's economic, uh, if fuel costs are a certain, a certain level, if the technology is there, in other words, if the seaway is regularized and, and, is, and enters global competition in a better way. Uh, the, the other thing that was interesting about the Russian study is it, par it, it, it parroted without, without parroting a study that Loss and I worked on in 2006 which was the idea that we might have a shuttle going across the Arctic of ice strength and container ships uh, that may or may not need icebreaker escort, but uh, do transshipping at a place like, uh, in the Russian case, Kamchatka, in the American case, Dutch Harbor or ADAC. Uh, in the uh, European case, it could be Murmansk or it could be, uh, be uh, Kirkenis or, or a number of other ports uh, in Europe. And, and what they've said here is that they believe they could enter this market and gain a large part of this market share by building seven ice class container ships, building surrounding infrastructure, and doing two port hubs, as I mentioned. And we've done a similar study in Alaska uh, with the Icelanders that uh, look, looked at doing this. I think you'll like uh, the uh, footnote, uh, Taro, which says that the, uh, uh, the Finnish uh, 5,000 TEU vessel is considered to be used as a prototype we actually came to the same conclusion about 10 years ago. I bring that up, and then there's, there's one other thing in this study that I want, want people to be aware of, is that the biggest driver in Arctic shipping in the next few years is going to be the Yamal project coming out of, uh, coming out of Sabetta, start 2017. The plan is 16.5 million tons a year by 2022. And they've ordered and have already delivered uh, the first uh, ice breaking, uh, ice strengthened ice breaking tanker, uh, which uh, 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 Vladimir Putin was at the naming ceremony recently. And that project is going to be four, five, six billion dollars a year, depending on oil prices, that will be paying for a significant amount, and the tonnage levels on the Northern Sea Route will grow significantly. So going back to what Taro said before, and if we can switch to the other slideshow, I, I will tell you the issue of paying for this. Uh, is, is a question that's on the Russians' minds and it should be very much on our minds uh, together. Uh, I made the assertion yesterday that if we took 5% of the trade in the Suez and applied it at current rates that the Russians have set in the Northern Sea Route, 
we could pay for all of those icebreakers, including the six that Admiral Zunkoff said he wanted to build yesterday. Uh, and whether it's Uber for icebreakers, to, to take your old phrase, or our concept of, a, of an Arctic Seaway moving together, I, I kind of look at uh, the cost of icebreakers, something around $30 million a year. Uh, the Russians will tell you that for a, a nuclear-powered one, it's more. Uh, the <coughs> Coast Guard budget is somewhere around $70 million a year. But you take uh, 900 ships paying a couple hundred thousand dollars a year, you can get to several hundred million dollars fairly quickly with a very small percentage of the market. If you have that, you can also help pay for ports. And let's talk about ports for just a second. Uh, if you get on an airplane today and fly to Japan, you'll fly over Cold Bay, Alaska. You, won't, you hope you don't get to Cold Bay, Alaska. Uh, but it's an airport where we keep the runway clear. Uh, it's a wide, long runway. It was built during the Second World War. And in essence, you have used Cold Bay, Alaska, if you're going to Asia from here. And uh, it costs us uh, uh, well over the $500,000 a year in revenue we collect to keep Cold Bay open. The point I'm making is this, is that's an alternate on your route, and it's very much a part of safe air travel across the Pacific. It's very much a part of safe ship travel across the Arctic to have Port Clarence as a port of refuge, to have uh, the other uh, uh, ports of refuge that you mentioned, uh, that you discussed in AMSA, to have the salvage capability. And somehow we've got to figure out a way to pay for all this. And so the concept of uh, going, going uh, from the small start that Paul Foos described yesterday, where we collect a couple of thousand dollars per ship using the North Pacific, to basically watch over their shoulder and to try to deploy, uh, 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 to, to deploy as much help as quickly as we can, <coughs> to actually having a fleet of icebreakers operating in the Arctic, whether they're escorts or pickets, to be able to do this. I'm going to win this steak dinner one way or the other, Lawson. But the point, <laughs> the, the point I'm getting at here is this: is that we we have the icebreakers now. Uh, uh, where we and the Russians and uh, the, the, the Arctic capable nations should work together. We should establish a tariff capability. I thought it was very interesting that Don Young talked about that yesterday. And if you have those capabilities, we can pay for a system. And this is a system that's three to $300 million to a billion dollars a year. And with enough of that, you'll be able to help uh, take advantage of what Gail Schubert is working on with Port Clarence, what we're working on possibly with transshipment ports in both, uh, both sides of the Pacific uh, on our side and Europe and, and Scandinavia on, uh, on the western side of the Arctic. And it's going to be seeing that infrastructure. So on the one hand, Sherry, I, it keeps me up at night because I know that some of these ships are going through and they have no knowledge or cognizance of the smaller ships, the smaller boats, the people in skin boats even using the Bering Strait. And we have to address that problem now. And the effort uh, to have a vessel traffic system in the Bering Strait to me is very important. Building up the AIS capability and the, the conversations back and forth to me is the first and immediate and we can do that today. Uh, but over the long term, I'm concerned that if we don't have enough traffic in the Arctic to pay for the infrastructure we need, we're going to be going out there. You know, it's, it's like uh, uh, having a big hotel someplace in the wilderness without a fire department. You may never need the fire department, uh, you hope. But you sure want to have enough of a tax base, enough activity to pay for the fire department, to pay for the, uh, uh, for the savings we need. And as part of this Arctic Circle, uh, uh, task force that we're doing. I mentioned that we've got uh, three different uh, questions going on. Uh, the questions really are, can we work together to establish safe, secure, and reliable seaways? Can a League of Arctic Ports help develop the, uh, the demand for this? And how do we pay for sustainable shipping infrastructure? Uh, I want to invite everybody here, or people watching online, uh, to be part of this process uh, and, uh, and to be in touch. Uh, and we're looking to have uh, a report laying out some, some courses that nations may take together uh, issued at the Arctic Circle Conference in, in uh, Reykjavik in October. Thank you. Well, thank you, Mead, for that incredibly thoughtful presentation. It seems, uh, wh regardless of who wins the steak dinner bet uh, between you and Lawson, it seems not 
not a question of weather, but just a matter of when uh, the Arctic Seaway, as you some version of an Arctic Seaway, as you describe it, with active uh, container ships and uh, LNG vessels is coming. Yeah, and and the Ru the Russians have one, but I honestly believe that it, by working together internationally, by taking uh, Foreign Minister Lavrov's invitation, which was sent to the Arctic Economic Council for international cooperation on this, that we're going to have a much better chance of having the capital investment from both the shipping countries, the receiving countries, and the Arctic countries to make the safety measures happen and to get over some of the legal differences that we have about who owns or controls what part of the Arctic Ocean. Right. It seems that that is important in the same way that the IMO Polar Code in some ways begins to de-risk the investment climate for those who want to be <coughs> able to further this vision that you've laid out. Um, we need to continue to think of those other governance type tools that essentially act to reduce risk um, for the um, investor and the operator. Is that right? Okay. Great. Okay, Des, you're up, you're up there all the time in the Canadian Arctic and elsewhere, and you, you've really got the view um, from, from the Arctic waters. I'm, it's a little Arctic in here, by the way. We <laughs> call this our Arctic <laughs> auditorium. Uh, so why don't you, uh, if you would share your insight with us. Sure. Can uh, everybody hear me okay? We're good. So uh, my, my, my thing that keeps me up, we, we also have a, what we call a marine safety duty officer. So when we see that phone number, two or three in the morning between June to uh, October, it's a little bit, uh, always an adventure to answer it. But it might surprise folks. It's, uh, it's actually not the, uh, the large cruise ships. It's, it's not the, uh, the oil tankers that operate in the Canadian Arctic. Uh, what keeps me up at night uh, from an oversight perspective, operational perspective, are the adventure cruise operators. And I'll explain to folks why that is an issue. So in the Canadian Arctic, and Tiro, uh, don't jump in yet until after I explain things, <laughs> but we have a very limited uh, capacity when it comes to icebreakers in the Canadian Arctic. In a given season, we'll have five to six icebreakers. So that five to six icebreakers has got to be there to provide escorts into communities for resupply, into mine sites for resupply. They also have to do search and rescue, scientific research. It's a lot of workload. The priority is always search and rescue. So what concerns me are the you know, five or six guys who are sitting in a pub in London thinking, you know what, it'd be a great adventure. Let's take sailboats up through the Northwest Passage this summer. And then the other guy has a pint, and oh, that's a fantastic idea. Nobody's probably ever sailed in salt water, probably never been off the coast anywhere. But these guys get it together and they bring their little flotilla up there and they get stuck somewhere. And then what happens is we've got an oil tanker that's probably going to be resupplying a community that requires an ice escort in. Now that ice escort has got to go down and get those guys. Two, three, four days. That community, security is put at risk. That vessel is put at risk. That vessel can't be compliant with our system because we won't allow it to go in. And it has a domino effect. Those are the guys that concern me because they impact through what can best be described as poor decisions and poor planning and create issues. And every year in the uh, Canadian Arctic, we have incidents where we have to basically stop and go down and get these guys at a cost to the Canadian taxpayer. These guys don't have to pay for this, and we put it at risk. Those are the ones that, that worry me at night. What makes me sleep a little bit better at night, though, is that for the most part, the, uh, the Canadian industry, when it comes to the Arctic operations, is very much a niche industry. It's uh, not a lot of uh, players within it. There's a lot of experience there. We like to think uh, through Canada with the Arctic Waters Pollution Prevention Act that we've had in place since 1970 and the associated regulations and, and the authorities that we have, which are, which are very broad and very, very strong, that we've been able to work with that industry and, and apply our our authorities accordingly. And when, uh, when we've had incidents where we've had to take action, we take action. We don't publicize it, but we do it. What makes me sleep uh, easier at night is uh, the new operators that are coming in, and Arctica is, is one of them, as an example, who uh, came in well in advance of planning any operations in the Canadian Arctic to make sure that not only are they aware of the Canadian regulatory regime, but also the realities of operating in the Canadian Arctic, and to understand the joint management that occurs in shipping in the Canadian Arctic. So in the Canadian Arctic, I always try to make this clear to everybody, it's not just Transport Canada and the federal government that you deal with when you deal with shipping. 
You have to deal with modern land claims organizations who do you have a responsibility, depending on the type of activity that you're going to be doing, that you have to meet with, that you have to apply for permitting from, depending on your activities. You also have to work with the other uh, federal regulators. Uh, there are many up there. And as well, our territorial partners. And uh, the work that, that Tiro and, and his team uh, did prior to the 2015 was an example of how we like to see things. Well in advance, year and a half, two years in advance, went through it. We navigated them through the regime. We navigated them through the environment up there, and it went well. The example of, uh, of uh, understanding of that is, is further evolved where uh, Tiro's uh, crew is going to be taking on board a couple of uh, Inuit students from the Nunavut Fisheries Marine Training Consortium who we support on training. We view the, uh, the Inuit and indigenous populations as a, a key demographic that we would like to see uh, increased participation mm -hmm. uh, within the industry. It, it coincides with the Government of Canada's uh, priority on reconciliation with Indigenous First, Pe First Nations. So we see those opportunities there. And we also see under our Oceans Protection Plan, which is a $1.5 billion investment that the Government of Canada is making to enhance marine safety and, uh, in Canada, and particularly in the Arctic, the opportunities to, uh, to enhance the oversight and enhance the safety and build from partnerships such as this. And, you know, partnerships such as the, the Crystal Serenity. And uh, every question, every time I go to a conference, I get a question. So I'm going to going to put this out there now because I know it's going to come. But the Crystal Serenity, it was a two and a half year planning process where they approached us and worked with us. And everybody sees that large cruise ship going through and think, wow, that's a lot. But the amount of planning, the amount of uh, above and beyond the regulatory regime that they put in place and the amount of monitoring, we monitored them pretty, pretty good. Uh, was an example of uh, how we like to see that going forward. And we hope that that's the case as we transition into the, uh, into the Polar Code. And I'll, I'll take any questions that folks have on that. But again, reiterate that these are the examples. And we look at proactive planning as the key. The response capabilities in the, in the Canadian Arctic are very limited. Places of refuge, we don't call them ports of refuge because there's not a lot of ports. We call them places of refuge, or, or actual geographical locations where you will seek out shelter. You're not going to go in there to get welding services. You're not going to go in there to get air lifted out. You're, you're going to go in there and try and do the best you can. We put a heavy emphasis on that, and we encourage all of our partners, uh, when you're looking at operating the Canadian Arctic, come to as well in advance, and we'll work with you, and we'll make sure that uh, a fairly safe industry uh, and a fairly safe uh, history continues uh, well into advance as we adapt into the Polar Code and continue with some of the Canadian components that we are going to maintain moving forward under the Polar Code. Well, Des, thank you very much. It, it sounds like um, the adventure seekers in the pub in London need to go through a two and a half year planning exercise before they come up to your region. You know, I, I, I think the uh, the medical term for those individuals are uh, idiots. Uh, <laughs> they uh, and don't get me wrong, the ones who plan it out uh, well, I, I'm I'm okay with. But we see it too often, and, and we do. Uh, we have a couple of uh, marine security operations centers. We scan. We scan a lot of these chat sites. We scan a lot of these things. We, we get a sense of where they are every now and then, uh, particularly in Canada, because in Canada, the reporting requirements, you've got to be 300 gross tons to report in through our Nordreg system for the north. Mm -hmm. So some of these guys get under that. So we, uh, and they create, they create issues in, in the communities where they show up. Uh, they, don't, uh, they don't act responsibly. They create issues within the community. And then we have to deal with it. So hopefully, uh, as we look at our regime down the road, we may look at uh, possibly how we can address that through other means of reporting, maybe lowering the threshold, because that is uh, an area of concern. And uh, given the limited capability capacities that we have, we have to be very strategic on, uh, on how we apply and who we monitor coming in. Right. Sounds like you may need a version of what we have our uh, emergency uh, rooms have here, which is they'll send you a bill after you've been there. There is, a, there is a model in Canada, not on the Marine side, but in uh, Vancouver. Uh, it's called the North Shore Search and Rescue Patrol. And if you decide to go up Grouse Mountain in Vancouver, which is a great place, folks, if you ever go to Grand Vancouver for a hike, and you go outside, if they have to get you, you pay. And sometimes uh, you need to put in a level of personal responsibility and a level of personal impact for decisions that really aren't well thought out. Well, thank you. Jeremy, uh, you've, you've spent a lot of time trying to uh, put NOAA's Arctic science into practice uh, for greater operating safety in the Arctic. Can you um, share your 
uh, insights with us, please. Absolutely. Thank you, Thank you Sherry. And I want to congratulate Mike and his team for what's been a fantastic uh, two days here uh, <laughs> for just highlighting what keeps me up at night. And you ask that question, and it's just simple lack of awareness. And we're running out of adjectives and superlatives to describe what's happening in the Arctic. And so just to put it in context, and I know I'm preaching to the choir to this room, but we ought to remind ourselves what's happening. In 2016, in parts of the Arctic, the average temperature for the year was 12 degrees warmer than the historical record going back to the 1800s. So imagine if Chicago or New York or Washington, D.C. had an average temperature increase of 12 degrees Fahrenheit from one year to the next. That would be front page news on every newspaper in the country and in the world. And because it's happening in the Arctic, it just doesn't resonate enough with the folks outside of our relatively small community. And that in lies my challenge and, and the very thing that keeps me up at night is that the environment is changing faster than we are able to constrain it and understand the impacts at this point. And as we've seen uh, from all the talks and particularly uh, from Mead and from Tara this morning, industry is going to outpace our understanding. Industry is going to surge into the region uh, and be in places where we don't have the domain awareness to successfully operate uh, or to protect the resources uh, that are up there. Mead made the great point uh, about the food security in the Bering, the Bering Sea uh, and the impacts that that could have. So as we think about how we're going to do this going forward, I've been pushing the science community to take more uh, of a security approach, to think about national security and food security as we collect information and we think about how we go uh, about our studies in the Arctic. Because it wasn't too long ago uh, when I was in graduate school, uh, which, which was back less than two decades ago, uh, that the Arctic was still very much the realm of science. We went up and we did process studies and we spent years planning and years doing cruises and years doing field work. And then we came home and we spent years writing up the results and years publishing in our, in our scientific journals. And that was enough. And now we see that that's just not the case anymore. The information has to be uh, more readily available and readily usable to the defense and security and economic interests that are working up in the Arctic and looking for expanded economic opportunities. So as part of that, uh, we had the opportunity this past year in 2016 to write a new five-year strategic plan for the Interagency uh, Arctic Research Policy Committee, IARPIC. We heard about this yesterday. Uh, Dr. Martin Jeffries serves as the executive director uh, of IARPIC in OSTP. And IARPIC is an effort to bring together everything that's going on uh, in the federal agencies uh, that are related to the Arctic in a more cohesive way where we can take advantage of the synergies and the overlaps uh, and really look at the collaborations and how they can occur. And as we put together our new five-year plan that was released uh, back in January, I took the opportunity to create a new collaboration team. And we called the collaboration team Environmental Intelligence. And Environmental Intelligence really gets at the heart uh, of this new mindset for what we're going to get at, at how we want to use and gather information in the Arctic. So Environmental Intelligence is just integrated environmental knowledge that's timely, reliable, and suitable for the decision support at hand. And we're trying to break down some barriers by doing this, by getting people out of the silos that they just naturally go into, into the scientific fields, and pull them up into what we're hoping to create a systems level understanding of the Arctic, where we combine observations, modeling, and effective data management in one centralized place so that that environmental intelligence can flow out into the DOD or the security agencies or our economic partnerships that are looking to, uh, to take advantage of it and be users of the data. It's not enough anymore for the scientific community to just, to just do the science and publish the results. We've got to be thinking about those end users and how uh, we can help uh, to solve the problems that, that are really becoming more acute in the Arctic. So if we can go to the next slide, just one click, whoever's got the clicker.
Perfect. What we come up with is what I call an environmental intelligence cycle. And this is actionable science focused on emerging issues and gaps in scientific understanding that are relevant to decision support and stakeholder needs. And the idea of this cycle is we go through it as quickly as possible because the faster we go through the cycle, the more responsive we can be to the needs of whatever the stakeholders are. And if you see at the top of the cycle there, it starts with decision support and application. We're going to start by asking what problem are we going to solve? Um, and that drives everything. We identify the stakeholder, we identify the societal benefit, and then we go from there. We look at our data archives. We're getting so much better at managing the data systems uh, that we have at our disposal. As big data grows, we are finally getting a handle around that and, and understanding how we can manage that resource. And so the first thing we have to start doing is when we identify a problem, rather than saying, okay, I'm going to go out and collect new information, we have to go into the data repositories and see what already exists and mine that effectively so that we can be as efficient as possible as, as we go through the cycle. Once we've done our assessment of our data assets and our data resources, we do go into an observational phase where we just fill the gaps of what we're missing uh, once our data inventory is done. Once we've identified our gaps and created and collected the observations that we need, we go in into an integrated systems level model where we use the observations that we've collected to effectively validate the models, hopefully on a systems level uh, for the Arctic. And then we go into our analysis and our assessment, looking back at the question that we asked, what decision we were supporting to see how we've done in that first three steps. And if we haven't done a good job or if we've missed efficiencies or if new technology has emerged to help us do something better, we go back into the cycle again and we keep going around and around until we either effectively solve the problem or we effectively create the technology or the data management systems or the models that we need uh, to get to those answers. So we hope as we go forward over the next couple of years in this new phase uh, of the IRPIC plan and as we think about new ways of working in the interagency space and working with our national security uh, and our economic partners, that this is going to have to be the new normal uh, for how the scientific community supports and works with uh, our stakeholders and, and our partners throughout the Arctic. So I'll stop there and, um, and happy to discuss anything right. else. Well, thank you very much, Jeremy. And you know the concept of environmental intelligence is very much music to my own ears as I have, um, you know, li like President Grimson noted that he has spent much of his, devoted much of his life to bringing the Arctic into the mainstream of global security and strategy discussions. I've spent much of my life bringing environmental concepts into the mainstream of national security decision making uh, in the United States. Some people call me the mother of environmental security. And uh, so this type of concept that takes the science, um, the very good science that we have throughout our research communities, and I want to say Arctic wide, not just the US, but the integrate, and actually makes them actionable for users, whether it's in the defense and intelligence community, within the operating Coast Guard community, shipping, um, energy, uh, all the, the users and the growing number of users in the Arctic, I think is vital, vitally uh, important. So thank you for, um, for sharing that with us. Now I know we are constrained on time this morning. We have to end here at uh, about 10.50 or so, which leaves us only about set six or seven minutes uh, for questions now. So what I'd like to do is invite um, any of those who uh, also have, I know we have many who are really um, experts already in this conversation, uh, any of our Coast Guard colleagues or our Russian colleagues or others um, who want to uh, pipe in with a question or a comment. Uh, and we have mics available. And we'll go right to your, your comments for the last and questions the last five minutes. Thank you all very much for your words. Um, my name is Sebastian Crisio. I'm from the uh, NGA Maritime Safety Office here in the, in the US. Perfect. And um, I also chair the Arctic Regional Marine Spatial Data Infrastructures Working Group, which is, falls under the um, IHO Arctic Regional Hydrographic Commission. 
Um, and uh, I just wanted to ask, uh, I think when a lot of times people think of spatial data, um, often the public uh, idea of that is uh, features that are, are mapped on land. Um, and uh, I was interested in kind of some of your thoughts in creating a, a better public awareness uh, to support generation of marine and maritime data um, that's needed to support things like safety of navigation and search and rescue, uh, particularly here in the Arctic. Great, great question, and great to have uh, NGA engaged in that work. Thank you. Hero. In terms of public awareness, uh, I think we're doing it for the moment and uh, m making in mind that, uh, first of all, the U.S. is an Arctic nation. But uh, I think that uh, if you look into uh, what has happened throughout the past 10 years, the public awareness has uh, increased a lot. But there's still a lot of work to do. And combining uh, the research into the operations uh, will provide a platform for this as well. well for, for instance, we will uh, go through the Northwest Passage again this summer. We have researchers on board. It's an Arctic 100 expedition. W it's going to be an international expedition with our icebreaker. Uh, so that, that's just, just one of the examples how to use that. And, and of course, the new or the modern means of communication and how to, how to educate the youth. So speak with the youth in terms of uh, how they make their, their dialogue and, and uh, go and talk with them. Yes, and then me. So we're, uh, we're undertaking some uh, work with under our Oceans Protection Plan in Canada. One that uh, we're involved in is called the Inuit Marine Monitoring Program. And we're partnering with uh, one of our main land claims organizations to help them as they uh, implement the uh, AIS-based system and actual monitors that are going to be community members that are going to maintain that equipment in Nunavik communities and as well monitor on the water. We're going to be looking at that as, a, as an aspect of an initiative we call proactive vessel management, which is to try and increase not only the, uh, the awareness but the understanding and the involvement of indigenous and coastal communities throughout Canada as we monitor and expand on, on our network. So we're looking at how we can take the, the, the typical Nordreg type of reporting system that we have in place now and expand it out and in a means and, and in a way socialize shipping and how shipping actually works and how it impacts and basically benefits communities, but as well get those community members involved in it. Actually, Tiro, uh, his group is uh, one of the first uh, corporate partners. They provided information to the Inuit Marine Monitoring Program, and they're going to be uh, working with them as they go through and monitor. And then we're going to look at how we can further utilize that data, traditional knowledge that we can collect from, from our Inuit uh, partners up north and then uh, look how we can further evolve and, and better the understanding of shipping and, and better articulate it, which, which we don't do as an industry very, very well. Sherry, I wanted to pick up, and thanks, thanks for your question, I wanted to pick up on something Desmond said earlier about possibly lowering the threshold for AIS. Um, Paul and I were serving in our governor's cabinet uh, when the Brer, tanker vessel Brer, uh, coming from the North Sea in Norway, crashed into the Shetlands and caused a big oil spill. And the state of Alaska, thousands of miles away, adopted a position <coughs> that urged IMO to require AIS uh, on ships so that a community could tell when a ship had lost power or steerage mm -hmm. to do that. We kept that policy, and uh, 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 Paul heads an organization now called the Alaska Marine Exchange, which has developed AIS receiver uh, information. He had one of the slides up yesterday showing marine traffic. That's because we have ground-based receivers on this, uh, on our coast, which we paid for out of cruise ship taxes, to be able to get real-time marine situational awareness there. I serve as chair of the Polar Advisory Board for Iridium, and this weekend we're launching 10 more satellites. And by the end of this year, I think we'll have 70 satellites in orbit, where Harris Corporation will have an AIS receiver on every single one of them and be able to give you AIS, uh, AIS, AIS data for every ship in the world that's broadcasting in real time. So you all have that capability at NGA uh, to buy that data stream. And I would concur with Desmond's recommendation that we lower the threshold for, for ships requiring this. There, there was an experiment discussed in the Bering Sea to help put this on some of the small boats because, uh, because you want the big boats to know where the small boats are because you can't always see them on radar in, in the ice. 
And uh, that for marine safety and for human safety is very important. So that's, that's one thing. I think the second thing, and th this point has been made several times at this conference, the United uh, as, as the Coast Guard Commandant said yesterday, as others have said, we, we proposed a vessel traffic system in the Bering Strait, not because there's a big traffic jam in the Bering Strait <coughs> right now, but if Russia and the United States join at the hip at this choke point, <coughs> we can give dynamic data to the marine community to say, you know, this is where the walrus are hauling out now. This is where the whale migration is going. This is where the hunters are. Uh, this is where the small ships are and so forth and preserve life safety uh, at, that, at that choke point. And I'm very much in favor of, of having more of what the questioner uh, asked because uh, if, if you try to draw lines and say just never go to this point or never go to this point, you're gonna restrict a lot of opportunity. But if you have good dynamic information that can be delivered to the bridge of a ship and collect information from the bridge of the ship, uh, we, we'll have a much safer Arctic Ocean. Taro, and then. In terms of collaboration in the Gulf of Finland, uh, 200 million tons of oil and chemical is being transported every year to and from the Russian port. Simultaneously, 8 million passengers going to and from Helsinki to Tallinn on a crossing traffic. So we definitely need a good VTS system and good systems to avoid the disasters. So there is something we can look into together. Again, collaboration. Just back to your original question about communications. I mean, the whole Arctic community needs to communicate better, particularly the Arctic Council. I, 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 I do go to a lot of conferences around the world, and I, I see, as Professor Geography, maps of the Arctic with no sea ice, and I actually saw some here. And, of course, that's a misrepresentation of, of the whole thing when we're, we're talking about marine transport. But just basic geography, and, and the Arctic Council has hundreds of millions of dollars of assessments and tremendous information of which uh, essentially the diplomats don't communicate to the world. Okay, yes, I think we have a, a last comment here. Sir, the microphone is next to you. Thank you. Я бы хотел кратко как представитель России прокомментировать три быстро три позиции. As a representative of Russia, I would like to comment three options. Первый вопрос безопасность. Я вчера в выступлении говорил, что Россия государство создает 10 центров вдоль Северного пути от Мурманска до Берингового пролива по функционал 10 центров спасения от транспортных аварий, от розлива нефти, людей и первый центр уже в Мурманске открыт. Uh, as I said yesterday, uh, the state is creating uh, security, uh, is um, creating uh, security centers uh, on emergency uh, to stay from emergency issues and uh, for to escape spillovers. Они планируют открыть в, те, в, те, в течение трех пяти лет все десять центров. Uh, all the ten centers are, are being planned to be open within uh, three or five years. Теперь про полярный кодекс, краткий комментарий. Ну, наш представитель международной морской организации Владимир Клюев, он адаптирует, он российское законодательство, оно регулирует вопросы безопасности плавания в северных морях, и мы приняли федеральный закон в прошлом году, и в принципе он сориентирован был и на учет тех требований, которые закладывались в полярный кодекс. Uh, now about our polar code. Our representative in the IMO, Vladimir Kluyev, is adapting, uh, is working on adapting uh, a, a Russian legislation uh, to the polar code, and uh, the process is coming, uh, and the uh, regulations uh, include. And last year we adopted a federal law uh, which included uh, the uh, sense and the spirit and the regulations of the polar code. Ну, как я, конечно, более детальной информации не располагаю, но мы всегда признаем, но ее нам нужно будет ратифицировать в полном объеме и, на, и наверное, дальнейшие действия еще предстоят по полярному коду. I do not have a deta detailed information. Uh, we uh, need to ratify it, uh, and we need uh, working further on the polar code. Ну и более интересный и сложный вопрос по по времени. Это вопрос, связанный с ледокольным обеспечением северных перевозок. 
Uh, and the more complicated and the more interesting question is regarding the icebreaking uh, support uh, of uh, shipments. Я вчера говорил, что приоритетом России в Арктике являются два направления. Это вот освоение шельфов и берега северной под добычей нефти и жирного газа. И второе, это, конечно, развитие Севморпути. Вот эти две стратегические основные темы развития России в Арктике. Uh, as I said yesterday, uh, there are two uh, main uh, projects uh, uh, regarding um, uh, icebreaking uh, uh, support. Uh, first is the exploration of the uh, sea shelf, um, uh, oil and gas uh, project on the sea shelf, and the second one. Uh, is the north, um, uh, is the uh, north maritime road. Я вот две цифры приведу для понимания. Если мы в лучшие советские годы выходили где-то ежегодная транспорт перевалка грузов по Севморпути была около шести с половиной семи миллионов тонн, то в прошлом году в шестнадцатом мы на эти цифры вышли. У нас семь с половиной миллионов тонн мы перевалили груза по Северному морскому пути. As for North Sea route, uh, in the best Soviet times, uh, we managed to reach uh, about 6.5, uh, 7 tons of ton shipment uh, yearly. And last year we uh, reached the same uh, figure and managed to uh, transship about 7.5 million tons. And you know that Russian priority is the development of nuclear ice-breaking fleet. У нас сегодня в действии четыре атомных ледокольных флота, остальные выведены из их эксплуатации по срокам своей, по своим срокам. Четыре. Today we have four uh, icebreakers. Uh, others uh, are uh, exploited uh, explo uh, explo no longer because of the technical outdated. И проблема заключается в том, что по прогнозам экспертов, которые оценивают добычу нефти и газа и перевал грузов по всему пути, у нас необходимость будет к 2024 году порядка 40 миллионов тонн груза сопроводить атомными литоколами, а к 30 году порядка 80 миллионов тонн грузов будет внутренняя перевалка в России. То есть к 2024 году 40 миллионов. Это не... Да. И к 30 году 80. According to the uh, profile experts, uh, we will need to convoy by ice-breaking fleet uh, about 40 uh, million tons um, till, uh, uh, at 2024 and 80 million tons till, uh, at uh, 2030. Руководитель Атомфлота, это мой товарищ, мой коллега Владимир Рукша, вы, может быть, его знаете, он говорит, что сегодня уже имеющиеся атомные ледоколы не обеспечивают вот, перевалку этого объема груза. Это нефть, газ, металл на, на нашем внутреннем вот, добычном рынке. And, uh, my colleague, the head of the at Russian Atomic Fleet, you may know him, uh, Mr. Vladimir Rukshin, uh, he said that uh, the current number of ice breaking is not sufficient enough even today uh, to convoy the shipment of uh, our uh, internal cargo. Uh, mainly it's oil, gas and metals. Поэтому сегодня заложен проект трех новых атомных ледоколов мощностью 60 мегаватт. Они будут построены в ближайшие три года. Первый спустится будет в следующем году. Первый атом. То есть три новых атомных ледокола строятся сейчас в России. And now there are three new atomic icebreakers are being built in Russia, and the first uh, three um, three icebreakers uh, uh, each per 60 uh, megawatts, and the first one will be uh, we expect it uh, next year. И атомоход лидер мы ждем в 26 году. Он разорвался проект мощностью 120 130 мегаватт, и его параметры будут 50 метров на 200. 15 примерно метров. Uh, at 20, uh, in 2026 we are expecting the new ice atomic icebreaker leader. Uh, its capacity is 130 megawatt and uh, his size uh, will be about 50 uh, per uh, 215 meters. Я вот говорю о сегодня о загрузке Севмор пути только на наши внутренние, ну, месторождения, которые будут развиваться в ближайшие годы. То есть сегодня говорить о даже международных перевозках. Мы сопровождали атомными ледоколами часть 
перевозок из Европы в Азию. Сегодня нет атомного ледокольного флота, мощностей, чтобы выйти работать в этом направлении, к сожалению. Uh, today I'm speaking mainly about our internal cargoes, because uh, um, uh, in the past we did uh, have uh, enough capacity to convoy cargoes, and but today we do not have enough uh, just to do the same. Ну, я не знаю, насколько международное сообщество может обеспечить проводку судов своими ледоколами, потому что мы в России опыт показал, что пока только атомные ледоколы могут без ну, которые работают по 3-4-5 лет без захода в порт, то есть не, не требуют энергетического возобновления, только они реально эффективно могут работать вот на трассах Севмор пути. I'm not sure if our foreign partners uh, have enough capacity to convoy cargoes, as our experts said and our experience showed. Uh, only uh, atom uh, those atomic eye breakers, uh, 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 which, uh, which, which may aut autonomically work for three, four, five years, can convoy uh, cargoes effectively. Это вот краткий комментарий, то есть Северный морской путь у нас находится в разработке. Мы, конечно, ожидаем и появления новых грузов. Мы строим новые суда ледового класса и в Корее, и в Китае строим транспортные суда для перевозки жиженного газа, угля, металла. Но вот Северный морской путь нам далеко до Советского канала, до, там, по-моему, под миллиард тонн перевалка. Но перспектива Северного морского пути очень сильная, и мы, конечно... Ожидаем и международного сотрудничества в этой сфере. We are now we are building ships, uh, we are building icebreaking fleet in Korea, in China to transport our LNG, our coal. Uh, we are far from the capacity of the Suez Channel, um, uh, but we are looking forward to international cooperation. Uh, Suez Channel is about, if I'm not mistaken, about one billion ton uh, cargo. Uh, we are moving forward and we are open for, co for cooperation, including international one. That, that was my short comment on the three questions uh, covered during the <laughs> Thank you. Thank you, Senator. Well, th thank you very much uh, for sharing those extensive comments. That's just what um, we had hoped for. Um, as part of this panel. And now um, let me thank uh, all, each of the panelists, uh, Lawson for sharing your uh, work on the IMO Polar Code, Taro for the icebreaker B&B, &B, Mead on the Arctic Seaway. Des, you're gonna make sure we have proactive planning and keep those adventurers in the pub in London. <laughs> and uh, we'll have full-fledged environmental intelligence with Jeremy, uh, Arctic environmental intelligence with Jeremy leading the way. So please, Join me in thanking the panel and President Grimson and Alice for this wonderful event. And, and allow me just to quickly wrap up by saying thank you very much for what I thought were two days of outstanding discussions. We hope that this is just a foundation upon which we will build more discussions. I want to highlight once again how pleased we are that our Russian colleagues uh, joined us and participated in these important discussions. And I want to uh, invite all of you to participate in our forthcoming programs, and those will be uh, sent out uh, as soon as we have those formulated. So thank you very much again for being with us for this Arctic Circle Wilson Center Forum. Thank you. Well, thank you very much.